I want to continue in our sermon series, The Questions of Jesus, and uh, going beyond answers, because often he didn't answer the question, and he didn't expect people to be able to answer the question. It was meant to be rhetorical. I think many of his questions were rhetorical devices. We're supposed to think, and I know that's hard, and it's painful sometimes to think, but it's important, and Christians should do more of it. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to think, and I wanted to go through Matthew 24 and 25, and uh, discussed it with a friend this week, and he convinced me that maybe we should move right along to Matthew 26 and consider the beauty of Jesus, because sometimes that's just what we need. We need to focus on Jesus. And so I will say Matthew 24 and 25, those chapters have a lot more dark and heavy stuff, kind of like Matthew 23 last Sunday. And essentially, Jesus says he's going to come and judge the world, and he will vindicate the righteous, and he will destroy all wickedness and evil, and all these promises about the impending judgment of the world. But in the, in the mix of all that, he says he will come and look for the ones who have been faithful. When he comes, will you have been faithful? That's his question in Matthew 24 and 25. Where are the faithful ones? And then Matthew 26, almost, I'm not going to say almost, I think very purposefully, the evangelist Matthew places an example of faithfulness. When Jesus comes, you know he will find some who are faithful. And I think that the woman we see today is one of those faithful ones. And so the question this morning from Matthew 26 is, why are you bothering this woman? Why are you bothering this woman? I'm going to read you the story, and then you'll better understand where that question comes from. Let's read verses 6 through 13. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? This could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, Wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Why are you bothering this woman? The setting of the story helps us. We're taken into the town of Bethany. Beit in Hebrew, Beit means house. So any Beth, like Bethel, is house of God. Bethany is, in this case, house of the afflicted or house of affliction. And you probably remember Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. And so Jesus has taken us full circle. We've journeyed from his birth in the house of bread, sustenance, life, to his impending crucifixion, finishing up his story in Bethany, the house of affliction. It would make sense that he, our great Passover leader, the one bringing us into the promised land, the one who becomes the lamb, whose Passover blood keeps us protected from death, that he would have to taste namely the bread of affliction, that his story would begin and end in the house of bread and the house of affliction. It's really almost a poetic device in Hebrew. It's a beautiful picture. It's dark, and yet it's beautiful. This won't be easy, Jesus having to experience affliction. In order to lead us there, he must first be acknowledged as the leader of the Passover, as the new Moses, the new King David, the anointed one, the rightful king. And you may remember how in the ancient Near East, kings were installed, it was through anointing. In fact, the word Messiah, how many of you are familiar with that word? Uh, in Greek, it's Christos. How many of you are familiar with that word? Christ, Jesus Christ. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Mashiach, Messiah. And in both cases, it means anointed one. So, Yeshu HaMashiach means, or Yeshua HaMashiach means Jesus, the anointed one. So when we say Jesus, the Messiah, or Jesus, the Christ, that's what we mean. He's the anointed king. Well, how do you anoint people in the ancient Near East? Oil. You use oil. You pray over it and you anoint them. That's how kings were anointed in the Jewish text of the Hebrew Bible. Kings like David. This king, the Messiah, the son of David, of the root of Jesse, would come and be the anointed one. And now we see his anointing. And it's not in a way we would expect, and yet it is a beautiful sight. 
So if this is the anointing of Jesus, the great Messiah, then why are the disciples indignant? Why are they bothering this woman? It's a good question that Jesus asks. And I think we need to be careful not to judge them too quickly. The disciples have good reason to question what's happening. Reading John Chrysostom's sermon on this from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, I thought it was compelling. Uh, He basically points out Jesus has been angry with the Jewish people. He's been preaching, God will have mercy, not sacrifice. He doesn't want your stuff. He's been telling them that what really matters to God is judgment, mercy, faith. It's love. It's justice. He's not concerned as much with sacrifices, burnt offerings, guilt offerings, sin offerings. What he wants is almsgiving to the poor. He wants you to take care of your neighbor. This is the stuff Jesus has been preaching all through the Sermon on the Mount. Love the poor and the the needy, the desperate among you. Take care of them, support them, uplift them, encourage them. Jesus hasn't stopped preaching. God doesn't care about your religious activity. He cares about your faithful love that you care for one another. So then when the disciples see a religious action like the anointing of oil, they're a little surprised that Jesus seems okay with it. Hasn't he been telling us all along that this is not what we're supposed to do? Shouldn't we have sold this and given the money to the poor? Isn't that what you've been preaching? I think they have a point. But even though they thought this, Jesus suffers her intentions. Because I also think that Jesus would have happily given that money to the poor. And yet he's okay for this event to take place. Why? Because great was the woman's reverence. As Chrysostom says, unspeakable her zeal. Wherefore of this exceeding condescension, he permitted the oil to be poured even upon his head. Basically, because she is so zealous in her love for Jesus, he allows something that might have been considered improper, something that may have been almost wasteful, to be done in love in worship, which I've had to think about all week. I wonder how often God suffers lesser forms of worship, incorrect postures, improper sacrifices, dare I say, bad theology, because of our reverence and love, because of the reverence of the worshiper, of the believer. You think about that for a moment. I wonder how often God suffers lesser forms of worship, incorrect postures, improper sacrifices, even wrong theology, because of the love and reverence of the one who worships. And I think, technically speaking, the answer to that is always. He's always accepting lesser forms, because none of us are able to do it just right. And so all God ever receives are imperfect forms of worship but he receives them nonetheless because of our love, because of our reverence. Let that encourage you this morning. Jesus rebukes his friends, his disciples, not because he's mad at them, but because they might deter this woman in her faithfulness. He's worried about her. He's worried about her spiritual growth. He's worried about her joy, her worship. He cares more about her and this moment at hand than he does about what could have or should have been. That's a lesson for me to care more about what's happening in a moment than what could have or should have been. The disciples live like most of us, thinking what could have been, what should have been. And Jesus says, let's just enjoy what is. Let's be in this moment. He crushes my critical spirit under his merciful fist. And I wrote that sentence very carefully. I think it's clever. Jesus crushes my critical spirit under his merciful fist. Chrysostom says, whatever good thing may be done by any human, though it be not quite perfect, to receive it, to encourage it, to advance it, and not to seek all perfection at the beginning, this is Christ's command. Whatever good thing might be done by anyone, though it's not perfect, we should receive it, encourage it, advance it, and not seek perfection at the beginning. And thinking about these things all week, I realize I'm too hard on people, like Dama shared. It's easy to be hard on people. It's easy to to set the bar too high. And I think I do it to myself. And I bet you do too. Set an unrealistic bar for yourself to reach and then project that onto everybody else. And then no one ever seems to live up to the expectation. It's easy to live that way. And Jesus reminds us not to. Lord, have mercy on us for our judgmental spirit. 
May we learn to bless others, to support their growth, to honor their worship, whether or not it makes sense to us in the moment, if it is sincere, if it is authentic. We need to be patient with others, and we need to be patient with ourselves and leave space for growth. You don't grow without failure. You can't get better at something if you already have mastered it and do it perfectly. It's just illogical, and God knows that, and a God of logic and order says, make space for the improper, the imperfect, so that it can be improved. But we don't. God help us. The story is amazing in the Bible. It's told in a lot of different ways. Matthew and Mark, in their Gospels, they leave the woman nameless. Luke labels her generically as a sinner, and we're not told what sin she's committed, although commentators love to imply that she's a prostitute. There's no reason to imply that. No one knows. John fills in the gaps. He says, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. In John 11, verse 2. So he tells us, this is Mary of Bethany. This is Mary from the house of affliction, the one who studied at the feet of Christ. And so I think it would be good to take a little closer look at Mary. In the account of Lazarus' death and resurrection, and I, I assume many of you remember that story. Jesus' friend Lazarus dies. He gets there four days later. The body's already rotting in the tomb. And he says, uh, I'm going to go see Lazarus. They say, no, no, no. By this point, he's going to stink. He's decomposing. You can't do it. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And he comes out alive. And he says, unbind him. And it's this powerful story of the resurrection or resuscitation of Lazarus. In that story, Mary confronted Jesus before he was raising Lazarus from the dead, when he just showed up after Lazarus had died, four days late, Mary confronts him and says, you should have been here to save my brother. And then she goes back to her mourning, her tears. She didn't understand who Jesus really was. And Jesus seems so deeply troubled by that. I think a mixture of the loss of a friend, the pain and sting of death, and also the failure of other friends to recognize his power and his love. A mixture of all of that emotion led Jesus to weep. It's one of the famous verses in the Bible. Jesus wept. He asked to be taken to Lazarus and then, of course, raised him from the dead. Mary, who sat at the feet of the master. If you remember, her sister Martha was mad about it. She said, I'm in here cooking and cleaning and my sister sitting at Jesus' feet, which was already improper for a woman to do in the presence of a rabbi. And she says, Jesus, tell her to come help me. And Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better thing. It's good for her to study. It's good for her to learn from me. That same Mary who learned from Jesus somehow missed it. The one who wanted the better thing, who was seeking it, missed it. She didn't get it. But then after witnessing the miracle of her brother's resurrection, she responds by coming once again to kneel at the feet of Jesus, this time with more understanding of who he truly was, who he is. In that beautiful act of faith, she breaks the costly jar of perfume, and she anoints Jesus. In this expression of humility, she cried at his feet. In a beautiful moment of repentance, she dries his feet with her own hair. It's a powerful story. Crowds who had heard what Jesus did for Lazarus gathered there. Simon the Pharisee was embarrassed that Jesus would allow such a sinful woman to touch him. Again, we're not told why Mary is sinful, but Jesus confronted Simon about his judgmental assumptions about Mary. He encouraged Mary to keep the rest of the oil for the day of his burial, a promise that she would then be there for the day of his burial, that she could anoint him once again on that day. So when Jesus was taken from the cross and laid in the tomb, I know we're fast forwarding the story, but when Jesus is crucified and laid in the tomb, it says in Matthew 27, Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. There she is, Mary of Bethany, no doubt holding that same alabaster jar that she used to anoint Jesus in the home of Simon. Now she stands ready to anoint her Savior again. What a privilege for Mary of Bethany to be one of the first who learned that Jesus had risen. Pope Gregory the Great named Mary the Apostle to the Apostles, which is a pretty cool title. She was the one sent to tell the others that Jesus had risen. She's the one who mistakes him for a gardener until he speaks her name. And then she realizes it was no mistake at all, for he was a gardener, and he had recreated the Garden of Eden. 
He was saving hu humankind, restoring us to God. She gets to go and share the good news before anybody else. That's Mary. And now Mary of Bethany will always be remembered and honored for her reverence to Christ. And so I thought about that this week. Why, why did Jesus say that? Why say that to his friends? Why say, and now she will be remembered as often as this story is told. We will honor her for what she did. Why even mention that if not because he wants you to recognize that's not how it normally works in the world? You think about all the kings, emperors, leaders, world leaders throughout the ages who have built massive armies, defeated incredibly tough enemies, structured walls and castles and everything else, and done all these remarkable things, had statues built of themselves. You think of even wealthy tycoons who even today might build skyscrapers and stick their name on the building, and, and people who do all these big and incredible things and hope to be remembered, and they're not. They're forgotten to the annals of history. They're forgotten. We might even read the name on the building and not think twice about who had that name, who it was, because we don't care. And yet, 6,000 miles away from Bethany in southeast Ohio, roughly 2,000 years after the fact, we honor Mary of Bethany for her reverent worship of Jesus. Oh, the loving kindness and wisdom of God. What a thought. And so my main point this morning, as I've been taught, you should have one thing that you need to say in a sermon. I'm going to say it. Our worship is never wasted. Our worship is never wasted. The disciples say, why this waste? And Jesus says, why are you bothering this woman? The implied answer to their question is, this isn't a waste. Worship is never a waste. God is looking for sincerity, not perfection. Authenticity, not certainty. And I'll say that again. God is looking for sincerity, not perfection. Authenticity, not certainty. It's taken me years to believe that. We can all be sincere and authentic worshipers. In fact, this church has created another opportunity for you to show that to God. This Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. at the night of worship, a chance for you, it's a shameless plug, a chance for you <laughs> to worship God sincerely to join with your fellow believers and spend a little time in the middle of your week celebrating God and what God has done. And we should bring with us the lessons from this woman on Wednesday night. Lessons about worship. Worship involves sacrifice. And I think there are at least four ways that Mary of Bethany teaches us the worship, or rather the sacrifice of worship. The first one would be ego or pride. Mary bows at the feet of Jesus. That's an act of humility. It's death to the ego, it's death to pride. To bow at someone's feet is to acknowledge that person is above you and you are beneath them. John, the dunker, John the Baptist would say, he must become greater and I must become less. It's the same idea. It's the death of ego, the sacrifice of pride. We bow at Jesus' feet. Secondly, the sacrifice of social standing. And this is one we don't often think of, but it's true, she let her hair down in front of a group of men. She knelt at the feet of an itinerant rabbi who had mixed levels of respect in the community. Some loved him, some hated him, some were waiting to have him killed. But here's Jesus, and she bows before him in the presence of men and undoes her hair. And this is an act of intimacy. It's a, it's a strange thing in the ancient Near East. It's not customary. It's in some ways scandalous. But she doesn't care. She's willing to give up her social standing, her status among her peers. She doesn't care what people think about her anymore because she only cares what Jesus thinks. That's freedom that I have never known. To not care what people think about you. To sacrifice what others think about me in order to better love Jesus. God help us to do that. She also sacrifices her possessions it's hard to, to explain in modern terms, but the best I could tell you is maybe 15,000 US dollars worth of perfume, something like that. If it's this many denarii, that's three, was it 300 denarii, that's 
300 days wages based on an ancient Near Eastern person and, and a typical blue collar job, we're talking maybe 15,000 modern dollars. That's crazy for a jar of ointment. And she breaks it open and pours it out all over Jesus. It's a lot of stuff, $15,000 worth of stuff. To some of us, that may seem like more than it does to others, but it's a lot to anybody. 15 grand? And she dumps it out all over Jesus. And the disciples say, why this waste? This could have been ours. We could have had this money. They don't say that, though. They say, we could have given this to the poor. And we find out elsewhere they, they really just wanted it for themselves. But she understood it's just stuff. To come to a point in worship where stuff is just stuff, where the surpassing greatness of Christ makes our stuff seem petty and worthless. Again, it's hard to even imagine that kind of freedom. Freedom from materialism. But that's one of the sacrifices of good worship, is that it severs the tie of possessions. We don't care about our stuff. And then finally, comfort. She sacrifices her own comfort. I don't know about you, but I have never and plan to never use my hair to wash dirt off of people's feet. It's disgusting. And it's maybe the most practical part of this worship that is easy to, to consider. She literally uses her hair to wipe the dirt off of his feet. It's nasty. And yet it's beautiful. She gives up her own comfort. Again, Chrysostom says, not as to a mere man did she come to Jesus. For then she would not have wiped his feet with her hair but instead as to one greater than a human could be. Therefore, that which is the most honorable member of the whole body, namely the head, she laid at Christ's feet. Think about that. It would have been enough to pour the ointment and use her hands and a towel to wash him with it. That would have shown humility. It would have shown dedication. But she took what was most precious on her whole body, her hair, the glory of a woman in the ancient Near East, and she made it filthy upon his feet as a way to say, I give up all that I have for you. I think people are less likely to fulfill this sort of genuine worship. It's rare. We hardly see it at all. It's a lot harder to do this than to simply sing songs on a Sunday morning and drop a few dollars in the box. To pour oneself out, as it were. So when I read the story again, I wonder, who do I align with? Am I like this woman who gives all that she has to Christ in worship? Or am I more like the doubting disciples, those who say, why the waste? Why? Why Why would you not care about your pride? Why would you not care about your social standing? How could you not care about all this stuff, the money? How could you not care about your own comfort? Now, if your instinct is to think, oh, I'd never be like the questioning disciples, I'd never be like Judas, the betrayer, then let's use a more current example. So let's say Valentine's Day comes around, and I'm talking to a friend of mine about what he did for his wife for Valentine's Day, and he says, well, I planned a surprise getaway to Aruba. She's mentioned it in passing over the years, and I knew she really wanted to go to Aruba, and hang out, you know, on the beaches and an island and all this beautiful stuff. And so I planned it as a surprise trip. We went for a week or two, and then we came back. It was wonderful. What would you do for your wife? And I say, well, I, I took Kylie to Tuscany for dinner. It was really good. <laughs> she almost got dessert, but I said, eat more of the free bread. It'll be fine. <laughs> it, it's... I'm glad you laughed. Uh, I hope you're laughing because you know I would not do that. I also don't think I would take her to Aruba. I don't think we could afford that. But it's, uh, I spent all my money on precious ointments to pour on Jesus. That's the problem. No, I'm just kidding. I, I do read these stories, though, and I, it's easy to think I wouldn't be the villain in a story. But the older I get, and I'm only in my 30s, so God help me when I'm 50 or 60. I don't know what I'll feel like. But I already see myself as a villain more and more in people's stories. I see that I am the one that says the mean thing, the one that projects my insecurities on other people, the one who doesn't build up but tears down, the one who just does all the wrong things, selfish, proud, all the stuff that I used to be judgmental of, and God just keeps turning a mirror on me and saying, it's you. 
You're not better than these people. That's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow to think I could be the villain in a story. And I don't know that there is a villain in the story per se, but there is a level of maturity and some who have not yet reached it. I'm afraid when I read this story, I'm the immature one who says, why the waste? Why do all this? Of course, Jesus acknowledges how beautiful and wonderful it is, but he makes it clear that his anointing as king served a second and equally important purpose. And it's the one he names. She has prepared me for burial. He's going to die. It makes the story all just a, a lot more embarrassing, more vulnerable, a touch too intimate. It's heartbreaking. Mary's pouring out oil unabashedly, proclaiming with her actions, as well as her words, the Song of Solomon. Set me as a seal over your heart, for love is as strong as death. She feels it in her bones. She knows something that we apparently don't seem to know yet as the other disciples, as those who are less mature. She knows Jesus is going to die. I don't know how she knows it. I don't know if it's just the Holy Spirit's leading. I don't know. But she anoints him as king and anoints him for burial. He's going to die. And her worship, even unto his death, will linger. It remains. There's something about smells that just remain with us. Sometimes not for the better. Uh, sometimes it's fine, though. I, just recently, uh, Kylie's family came to visit, and her dad was unpacking the suitcase and setting some stuff on the kitchen counter, and his, I don't know how this happened, but his bottle of cologne fell and shattered on the counter, the kitchen counter. And it's like, it was like a strong cologne, and it still smells like that. That was probably two months ago. And I have sanitized that counter every other day ever since. We, you know, we wipe our counters down like healthy people probably should, and I use the Lysol spray and all that, and it doesn't matter. It's still, if you lean over that counter, it smells like cologne. I don't know if it'll ever go away. What a strange thing, the way smells linger. I still think of my dad, who's been deceased for five years now. I think of my dad every time I smell Obsession by Calvin Klein. That was just the cologne that he wore most of my life. Something about that smell makes me think of my dad, makes me picture him. Same thing with Axe body spray. Whenever I smell it, I still picture teenage boys who are trying too hard. <laughs> There's a reason. There's a reason we light candles. There's a reason we diffuse oils and wear perfume and cologne. It's because smells have power. There's a reason religions use incense in their worship. It's in some way nostalgic, isn't it? Olfactory has this strong input into the amygdala. It, it compels us to feel things, often good feelings, happy memories, helps us process emotions. Perhaps Jesus would remember Mary's love and devotion as he smelled the perfume on his body as he was hanging upon the cross. I've thought about that before. I wonder if as he breathed his final breaths, he was for a moment transported to that house in Bethany and reminded why he was dying in the first place. Because he loved her. Because he loved you. And he could smell it. It's an amazing thing. Sometimes I think God hides the most beautiful stuff. So it's not easy to see. Perhaps even we'd have to smell it. I don't know if it's the intimacy of the scene or the expression of Mary's passion, but something unsettles Judas and the other disciples. Something makes them uncomfortable, and their words are a classic red herring. Oh, shouldn't this have been sold and given to the poor? It's under the cloak of social justice, justifying evil, saying, ah, see, I, I, know, that, I know that this is somehow good, but some part of me doesn't like it, and I don't know why, so I'm going to use a good excuse to explain it away. We do that all the time. And Jesus, he goes right back at him. He challenges them. It says, the poor you will always have with you, which is not Jesus' numb acceptance of poverty, saying, ah, there's always going to be poor people. Who cares about them? It's quite the opposite. Jesus is saying, this is a poor people's campaign. They're my main constituents. That's who I came to rescue are the poor, physically and the poor in spirit. There will always be poor. As long as there's a church, 
then there will be a place for the poor to come and be cared for. I think that's what Jesus means. You'll always have the poor and you'll always be able to take care of them, but I'm about to leave. You're not going to have me much longer. He knew he was about to die. There's no easy path out for Jesus. There's no simple solution, no avoidance of suffering and crucifixion for our Lord. He must die so that we can live. It has to happen. And I think something about that has clicked for Mary of Bethany. She has trusted him completely. And she lays herself and all that she has to offer at his feet. And so I thought about that and was reminded of King David. I wonder if, if that's the same level of trust, the same sort of embarrassing, self-sacrificing devotion that led King David to dance uncovered in the presence of the Lord, to the chagrin of his own family and his friends. I wonder if it's the same level of trust and embarrassing devotion that would allow us to stand in a place despite all the opportunities to fight back and defend ourselves and prove ourselves and appease ourselves, to then stand in awe of Jesus and offer heartfelt worship. In fact, I can think of no better way to conclude this sermon than to spend time worshiping God together. So I think that's what we'll do. Would the band come back up and would you stand with me? I've selected a few scriptures, and I want them to guide us through a moment of worship before we come to the Lord's Supper. First, consider the greatness of our God. And uh, in fact, the band, and I'll put this pressure on Aaron. Oh, he's busy having fun. Hey, no more fun. We're at church. Uh, in all seriousness, I'd love if maybe you play softly while I'm talking. I'm going to read scripture. I think it'd be nice to have a little music underneath. Nothing too loud, okay? They need to be able to hear what I'm reading. Perfect. That's perfect. Okay, did you get it out of your system? It is, it is okay to have fun at church, by the way. I know I joke about that. Uh, but, man, there's reasons we can have fun, and it's because of how great our God is. And I think it's good to acknowledge that. Psalm 145, 1 through 9. And I think I put all these in the computer so you can read them on the screen as I read them aloud. Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one could fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome deeds and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. Compassion is a beautiful word, by the way. It means with suffering. To have compassion is to suffer with. We don't think about that often, but that's what it means. God will suffer with his creation because of the great love he has. That's what Jesus was prepared to do. That's what Mary was acknowledging when she anointed him for burial. And so we have much to be thankful for. We could praise God not just for his greatness, but for creation. Psalm 19 one through four, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies above proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Do you know what the psalmist is talking about? He's talking about the feeling you get when you look out at the expanse of the ocean, when you stand on the beach. And when you look up into the hills and mountains, and there's no words being spoken, but you feel the weight of it. God says to you how great God is, and you, you don't even know how to understand it, but you feel it. 
this greatness. You look up into the sky, you look at the stars and the heavens. There's no words being spoken, but you hear God. You begin to see. I think it'd be good to take just a moment and silently thank God for specific aspects of creation, of things around you that remind you of the greatness of God. Let's do that right now. Let's just take a moment of silence and think. What things in my day-to-day life make me consider the greatness of God? Maybe to help us along, some of you could shout them out as you think of them. Sunsets, good. Sunrise, that's piggybacking, but we'll take it. What'd you say? Oxygen. Oxygen. I'll try to repeat them so everyone can hear. What else? The Northern Lights. Aurora Borealis, so cool. See, I'm smart, I know that. Flowers. I thought of babies. Rainbows. Clouds. Give me a couple more. Say that again. Eyesight. Oh, vision. Birds in the morning. It's beautiful things. And just to stop and think of them is to glorify God who made them. What an awesome thing. And he didn't just make the stuff. He rules over it. He cares for it. He protects it. He provides for it. We call all of that the sovereignty of God, his kingship over the world. And we read about that in Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He won't grow tired or weary. His understanding no one could fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even young people grow tired and weary. Even young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in our Lord renew their strength. This is my dad's favorite Bible verse. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. God is sovereign over our lives and our circumstances. I don't mean he controls every detail. I don't think God causes the bad and evil stuff. And we could talk about that another time. But he's, he doesn't lose his grip when evil takes hold. God doesn't, he doesn't forget about you in those moments. He's always with you, able to provide and to protect and to sustain and to redeem. God, help us to trust in your perfect power. And then we reflect on God's faithfulness. Lamentations 3, which is an odd place to turn for hope. Lamentations was Jeremiah's appeal to Israel to lament. They should be brokenhearted that they have abandoned God and that God has seemingly abandoned them. They've been taken into captivity. It's the end of Israel. At least it seems that way. But Lamentations tells us we're not left lamenting. We're not left in sorrow. This is what we read. Because of the Lord's great love, We are not consumed because his compassions never fail. When God suffers with you, it always succeeds. When Jesus dies for you, you will live. God does not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Consider God's faithfulness throughout human history, throughout your life this morning. Consider how faithful God has been. How could we not be grateful? Would you pray with me? God, we are so, so thankful this morning that you are good and powerful and merciful and patient and full of loving kindness. Though we are often immature in our response, though we wonder about the waste, though we question our own pride gets in the way, though though we often fail to give you all that you deserve, though we worry about our social standing and what people think of us, though we concern ourselves with how much we have, our possessions and material things, though we seek comfort and pleasure 
over goodness and justice. Despite all of these failures, you love us and you are patient with us. Help us to grow, to be perfected in your love, to learn how to worship rightly, that we might pour ourselves out at the feet of Jesus as he poured himself out on the cross for each one of us. It's in his name and because of his faithfulness that we can even speak to you now. And all of your children said, amen.